Hey, this is Christian Buckley doing another MVP Buzz Chat interview, and I'm here with Rocky. Hey, good morning. Hey, how are you doing, Chris? Good, good afternoon, I guess. So, uh, yeah, that's true. It is good afternoon, isn't it? Well, Rocky, why, why don't you introduce yourself, who you are, where you are, and what you do? Sure. I'm Rocky Latka. I am the CTO at a company called Magenic, and we're um, a big, well, I don't know if we're big, but a, a reasonably good-sized uh, software development consulting company. And uh, also over the last um, long time, I've been uh, doing uh, writing books and, and speaking and building open source uh, software in the .NET development space. And we were just chatting about before we started recording. So Rocky and I, I think we've, so we've been in the same room a few times and I, I think I've, I've seen you in passing in, in crowds, but never, never really uh, uh, chatted before this. Uh, but you're, you're, pretty uh, uh, you know, steady on the, uh, the, the regional director, the RD email lists and some interesting topics to go in there. I, usually when, when people are getting so in-depth down in the weeds of what's going on with Azure, I don't really weigh in. If there's any discussion that's around the collaboration technologies or more the front end or on the partner side, then uh, I mean, I'm, I'm right inside those conversations. But um, yeah, so the... So with everything uh, you know, kind of going on now, a lot, of, a lot of the different discussions. I mean, it, it's. Uh, I mean, how how are things going for you? Uh, how, how are things with Magenic? Is business still hopping along? Well, it's definitely a different time uh, for everybody, and uh, we're doing quite well. Um, but there's definitely an impact, and and I think the longer this goes on, the bigger the impact will be. Uh, you know, and on our clients and, and therefore on us, right? It's it's because um, we exist purely uh, to build software for our customers. And so when our customers are, are struggling, obviously that has a ripple effect. Um, we were fortunate in that uh, our company was, or our consultants were already, oh man, I got to say over half of them were worked remote, either always or sometimes. Yeah prior to all of this. And so for most of our technical staff, it's been a, you know, as easy as it could be. I, I wouldn't say easy, right? Um, but uh, certainly for our, uh, you know, office staff, uh, this idea of working from home for, you know, accounting, HR, every, every marketing, um, you know, it was a, a big adjustment for a lot of folks and, and some people like it and some people are struggling. And yeah, I think it's a microcosm of the bigger world. The, the group that's really struggling the most is uh, our sales group. Um, yep. for, uh, probably on a couple different levels. One, because if you're in sales, almost by definition, you, you like people, right? <laughs> and, and you, you enjoy, uh, you know, interaction and, and all of a sudden you're deprived of that. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and then it's just, it's playing hard as you can probably imagine, um, to get anyone's attention, um, about, you know, oh, you want to build some software, you know, you solve a business problem and everybody's kind of hunkered down with uh, bigger things on their mind. Um, but then we've got some customers too, that are in industries that are, uh, under, um, I don't know how to put it, but but uh, they're they're very busy because of various aspects of um, what's going on right now with with uh, COVID, and so some of them are scrambling to build software or complete projects that that were in process um, that can help. So you know, that's good too. Well, I'm interested to know. So, like speaking of that that process, obviously going out and 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 you know, and I felt the impact as an independent, you know, of closing deals, of meeting with people, like that side of things. So talk about, so, you know, Magenic, and, and, and I'd like to hear a little bit about uh, your methodology and, and CSLA.net and, and the process that you work with clients to, to build software. Is that something that came out of the, 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 the company or was the company, what's the background of Magenic? You know, was it more built on some of uh, this, this process of methodology that you've developed? 
Well, it's uh, kind of interesting because they're actually in parallel. Um, I started working on CSLA back in the 90s. It was a COM-based um, deal at that point in time, uh, you know, predated .NET. And at that time, I worked for a, a different consulting company. And uh, I'd started writing books and, and speaking at conferences and, and building this uh, uh, essentially open source software, but the internet didn't exist back then the way we think of it now. Um, and my employer at the time was like, hey, that's really great. Uh, you know, if you want to speak at a conference, you know, take some vacation, go for it. Um, you know, if you want to write books, you know, that, that's a nice hobby for your evenings and weekends. And, um, and, and to start with, that was fine with me. But then after you know, two, three years, you know, the company started benefiting greatly from both a sales and recruiting perspective. Um, and, um, and they were unwilling to uh, recognize that, I guess, or at least you know, in a way that you know, I, I had little kids at the time. And, and uh, so ultimately, I was getting, uh, getting coaching from uh, another gentleman. You know how in any given city, I think, there's a relatively small community of, of uh, active tech people. Right, the ones that go to meetups, user groups, and, and so forth, and so, um, and and I knew that that this guy uh, uh, owned and ran a competing consulting company, um, but you know he's a smart guy and was giving me literally giving me advice on how to um, succeed where I was, even though I was working for a competing firm. And that didn't go anywhere. So eventually, I went back to him and I said, "So, Greg, you know, all that stuff you've been telling me for the last you know year and a half or so." Uh, you really believe that? <laughs> you know? And he said, why? And I said, well, because maybe I should come work for you. And uh, so I, I switched. Uh, so that was the year 2000. I, I switched and started working for Magenic. Um, and so, yeah, so for a while, Magenic did quite a lot of, of work CSLA-based just because my writing and speaking brought in a bunch of business um, around CSLA, but it's always been a minority of what, what we've done as a company. Uh, we've, we've always had a, our own sales force and, and brought in a wide array of different customers. Um, sometimes they do CSLA and sometimes they don't, and, and we don't pressure them one way or the other. Um, you know, CSLA, uh, when, when the, uh, well, for the last 10 years, when, when people largely quit writing smart client apps in favor of writing web apps, especially Angular and uh, that sort of thing, CSLA, um, I, I can't say that it's not with, it doesn't have value, but its value proposition is limited or is lessened if, the, uh, if your client isn't a smart client, basically. Um, if your client is written in, in JavaScript or TypeScript, you obviously can't share that code with server-side code that's uh, C-sharp, right? Um, and, uh, but now there's uh, the Blazor in particular, but also Xamarin um, resurgence. I, I'm just, I can't express how excited I am um, now by the fact that, that we're looking at uh, you know, we can build apps that run in the browser, but we don't have to, we're not limited just to JavaScript anymore. We can use, you know, C, C++, C Sharp, Java, well, maybe Java, Ruby, what's, Go. What's driving a lot of that change? I mean, what's, what's, what's different now? Is it just a lot of the, because I know that there was a, a, a kind of a delayed response for a lot of enterprise organizations with their kind of legacy solutions that they've gone and built. Is that part of what we're now seeing the change happen? Because these companies that have this massive investments in prior technologies saying, how do we actually move these things over to the cloud? And they just weren't willing to go in and completely re-architect, build them from the ground up and want to leverage or, you know, what, what is driving some of the, the shift that's happening now? I think a lot of it, I give credit to a technology called WebAssembly, uh, which has been, uh, it comes out of the Mozilla originally. Um, but now it's an internet standard and it's built into all of the modern browsers and it uh, allows the browser to run JavaScript like normal and also now all of the browsers have an assembly language engine that 
Um, so instead of JavaScript or in addition to JavaScript, you can now run compiled code. Um, so it's like take C, C or C++ or Rust or whatever, compile it into uh, WebAssembly instead of like uh, x86 assembly. And it'll run in any browser anywhere. And um, so that, that's the technical thing that's happened. The business driver, to your point, is that there's just a massive amount of, of uh, especially Windows Forms and WPF uh, applications out there that um, have never been migrated onto the web. I think in not in small part because the the early web couldn't do what those apps did, right? The rich interactivity, the, you know. But but as we now know, um, you know the modern web, like like you look at Word. You know, who would have ever thought Word or Excel could run in a browser? And okay, so all of Excel doesn't run in the browser, but a pretty good chunk of it does, right? And that's even without WebAssembly. <laughs> um, you know, so now you take um, the, the fact that modern web development really can create smart client apps comparable to WPF or Windows Forms. Um, and then you tell all of those developers that they don't have to switch their entire skill set to JavaScript, but yet they can continue to do, uh, you know, .NET and C Sharp. It's like, okay, maybe the dam is breaking here. Maybe now I can, I've got a path forward that still lets me do smart client development, give my users the same uh, type of experience that they're accustomed to, uh, let me use relatively familiar development tools. Um, but I've got, um, you know, complete deployment and you know, web deployment without all of the complexity of installing software. Well, that certainly opens up uh, just the, uh, the, the the job field so that you're not, you know, again, looking for that specific skill set. You can, you've got more, uh, you know, a, a wider net you can cast for solutions that you need to build for, for an organization. Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, you know, and then there's a lot of, you know, I don't know, angst, whatever. It's like, oh man, is WebAssembly uh, gonna, you know, completely replace Angular? Um, and, uh, you, know, uh, you know, that's not the way this industry has ever worked, right? A, a, a technology becomes successful, enterprise apps get built in that technology, and the technology then often lasts for like 20 years. Now, it might not be the, um, the forefront, you know, of, of our thought process, and, and for all we know, you know, Angular, uh, uh, I mean, we're at the inception of all this. So it's hard to sit here today and, and look forward five or 10 years and go, oh man, in 10 years, the, the world is going to be X or Y or Z. Um, you know, all I can say is that as somebody who um, has never been particularly excited about JavaScript web development, um, you know, this web assembly stuff makes me very excited. Um, but I work with people, tons of people at Magenic that absolutely love building Angular and React apps and use TypeScript and, and JavaScript. And, um, you know, they're going to be able to continue to do that for many years also. So I, I don't... We were just talking, somebody posted out on in a group that they were looking for uh, help with a client and they were looking for people that had COBOL skills. And I was just joke that back in the early 90s, I was working for EDS. I was a business analyst and uh, I got pulled aside. My manager said, hey, you've been identified as somebody that we'd love to pay for and go through COBOL training, become a COBOL programmer. And I declined. It was all, you know, as they were starting to ramp up for, it was like 94. They were, I think, ahead of the curve a bit on Y2K stuff. And... Uh, so I had friends that went and went through that process and they financially have done very well. Both of them have retired early, <laughs> you know, oh, I, I have no doubt. That's uh, well, and now that's been in the, uh, certainly on Twitter, but I think in the news a little bit too, about how some of these uh, unemployment uh, systems at the state level, like in New Jersey, are all written in COBOL, yeah. and and they're falling on their face because the uh, you know, unemployment claims are what ten or a hundred times, I've, uh, just massively higher than they've ever been before. Yep. Um, and so there's this huge cry. It's like, hey, you know, anybody who knows COBOL, please come help us out. <laughs> 
Well, that was it. The project I was on, it was uh, California Medi-Cal. So massive systems and all built on COBOL. And, but uh, yeah, the, uh, it depressed me then to think about going that direction, that, down that path. But financially, it would have done okay. But to your point, it's, you, know, you, you have these massive enterprise systems, these legacy systems. Someone has to maintain those. There's going to be, it's not the exciting, sexy new technology that the kids want to go and stu study in school. And yet you have massive investments that are still made in upkeeping these systems. And, uh, and while we can, it's nice to sit and talk sometimes about upgrading, re-architecting, moving things over to the latest technology. Uh, and some of these systems, it's like, it's, it's just not cost effective to go in and do that. It's actually cheaper to maintain and then build new systems on new technology. Well, it, it, something, another question, I, I, you know, I know that you're still doing a lot of events, a lot of speaking. So what, what are some of the topics? Like, what are you out there talking about? What, what's kind of the latest exciting stuff that gets you off the couch to go and speak in an event? My focus has really, I would say, been on three areas. Um, I, I, I'm interested in a lot of things, but you, you can't uh, get deep enough in all of them to speak credibly, right? So the, the three things that I've been talking about, um, uh, moving from .NET Framework into .NET Core, .NET Standard, um, and .NET 5 is around the corner. Um, and then the and that's part technology and a lot of its process though. It's actually, right. It's just like any software migration thing. There, there certainly are technical tips and tricks and approaches, but at the end of the day, it's a lot about process. Uh, not surprisingly, I've been talking a lot about WebAssembly and uh, Blazor and a similar technology called Uno that both are uh, UI frameworks for .NET running in the browser. And then the third area is uh, Kubernetes and container-based server computing, because I, I have this picture of, uh, of the near future where modern, you know, like new software that gets built, um, all the server stuff gets written and uh, run in containers and probably runs in, in either Azure AWS or Kubernetes, or, or maybe both. And, um, and the client software is all running, is written using uh, WebAssembly and is running in the browser. And so you've got portable code on the server and portable code on the client. And, uh, you know, the only, the only place that uh, even like Windows ends up being relevant in this whole picture uh, is that Visual Studio runs on Windows. So I, I, as a developer, use Windows, but really my end users... They're using a browser on any device and they're talking to containers that are almost certainly running in Linux um, and then are running on some cloud somewhere. What have your what, what topics have you written about like the, your, your books? I sorry, don't know your stuff, not don't live in the dev world, uh, you know, other than I've known your name for years. I've seen you inside occasionally it when you and then of course I when I became an RD and within the program, I see you there, but uh, yeah, I'm not familiar with the body of uh, written word that you've put together. Yeah, when I, I think about that, um, it, it, I, I almost sound like a broken record. I, 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 what I've been writing about for years is uh, uh, how to architect enterprise software using Microsoft's tools um, so that you end up with maintainable, scalable software, um, uh, primarily in a distributed setting. And so I've been you know, all this time talking about how to create app servers and, and uh, uh, talk to them efficiently. And, and so I think things like containers uh, and Kubernetes are just an extension of that. Um, and similarly, um, I spent uh, all of my books have focused on whatever kind of UI technology is current at the time. So, you know, it's, it's gone through Windows Forms and Web Forms and ASP MVC. And um, I wrote a book using Silverlight at one point, which uh -huh. uh, Silverlight was so nice for the whole year and a half we had it. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, so, uh, so really, yeah, I guess it's, it's been a consistent theme, which is basically how do, how do you create um, maintainable software um, that uh, hopefully as the UI technologies change over time, because they will, they always have, um, how do you not have to rewrite your entire app just because there's a new UI framework? 
Um, and how do you have to not rewrite your entire app just because there's a new app server uh, technology? That, that's kind of the, the core focus of the things I've written over the years. You know, it's just observation too, is that you know, it, with the community stuff that I do and, and here it's where I live in just south of Salt Lake City. I'm in Lehigh, which is kind of the tech hub for uh, the, the region, they call it. Silicon Slopes, and it's a it's, there's a heavy investment, a lot of startups in uh, in the fintech area, and you, there's user groups on various technologies, and so much of the training. And in fact, there's a couple of the schools of the uh, uh, software schools, kind of the new flavor of of, uh, of trade school for technology development that have kind of sprung out of this area here in the Bay Area. Um, but you see a lot of them where they go in and do this, you know, do these these rapid programs in specific languages and you know technology areas. Uh, what guidance would you give to people that are you know that they're still in school or that they're looking to add to their career? That's more, I guess, I, I look at it as more of the kind of the DevOps training. Of there's the specific you know, uh, um, shovel in hand, how do I go and dig this uh, trench versus the, uh, like, let's step back and look at how you organize, uh, you know, DevOps inside of an organization, what are the best practices? Is there, I mean, what guidance would you give to students that, you know, of how to approach development in kind of the, the modern era, um, rather than just go focus on a specific technology? Because a lot of, Again, my perception is a lot of these students, this is certainly true um, when I was closer to the DevOps space in the late 90s and, and early 2000s, that you know, students came in really smart in, uh, in, in coding and, and solving these specific problems, but then had absolutely no idea how to apply that in real world scenarios and then had to be kind of re-educated on how companies built uh, uh, software. So what guidance would you give of, of where people should start and what should they should consider? Well, about 10 years ago, a little, maybe 12, Magenic started a, a thing that we call the delivery center, which is, because uh, normally all of our uh, consultants have maybe 10 years, seven, seven, 10, 15 years more experience, right? Mm -hmm. Um, but we created the delivery center with the intent of hiring folks right out of school um, or, or, or that had just made a career change. Um, I, I think initially our, our vision was, oh, it's just all going to be right out of school, but it ended up being kind of a mix. And that some of the people we've hired are like 40 something um, and I've switched careers, right? So kind of the same, but, but the, the idea being coming in with, um, without a wealth of pre-existing software development experience. And the way that what we've, I guess, found over time is like those boot camps or other quick, uh, kind of quick hit uh, coding camp type deals vary in quality a lot. Um, and also uh, individual people vary in their uh, attitude and aptitude a great deal. And so, and, and these two in my mind are, are synergistic in that um, what makes somebody successful um, is in part, like if you go to a, a boot camp that teaches you Angular and you never learn JavaScript, uh, which we, we encounter people like that, you're not useful, at least not, not in our world, because you got to build software and just creating the, the UI is not sufficient. You have to be able to talk to servers and so forth. Um, and um, so some, you know, some code camps are better about that than others, right? So they, they take a slightly more holistic approach. That's good. But then a lot of it ends up coming down on the student too, um, as an individual, um, do you do the minimum necessary to get your certification, you know, pass the class, get the certification, whatever it is, um, or do you really fall in love with this stuff and dig in and, and you know, you not only do the uh, homework assignments, but you decide, oh, I'm going to write a little game on there, whatever, I don't, you know, I'm going to write a recipe uh, tracker, I basically have your own little um, projects. And so by the time that you're done with the class, you've, you've learned all the things you're 
um, your program has to offer, plus you've actually tried to exercise it on your own. Now, those like people are, are like gold, right? Right. Well, yeah, the people that go in and get their hands dirty. I mean, look, I, there's a, uh, so I, when I started at university, I was an industrial design major. And part of why I changed my major two and a half years into the program was because I, I had friends that were uh, older that were graduating, were having difficulty finding jobs within that space at that time in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, and, but then also looking at what kind of jobs and things were, were, were possible and what those roles actually looked like. And I started getting feedback that in, it was, you'll get the kind of the comparison here, but the, you know, that I didn't want to do the jobs that people were actually getting jobs doing with that, <laughs> that training. And, and so it, it sounds like your, your advice and it, you know, is always like, look, that's why doing fellowships, that's why doing going and, uh, um, you know, between your, you know, generally between the uh, sophomore and junior and but before your senior year of university that you go and do these, uh, uh, you know, these, these fellowships and other projects, go get, you know, feet on the ground experience, real world experience, um, even if it's, uh, you know, for hourly or even some, some cases, free projects to get that experience and get a, a taste for it. Is this something that I actually want to go and do? That's exactly right. You know, and um, I mean, it's just, it sets the, sets people into two different categories, right? The, the category of folks that, that learn, um, that they assume that whatever they learn in those classes, um, and this is true if you go to university too, right? You can go through and just learn what you need to get good grades. Um, and that's fine. Um, or you can actually be applying that, you know, that information and knowledge and trying to, like you, like you said, contribute to the, uh, you know, there's all sorts of, especially now, right? There's open source projects you can contribute. There are uh, internships or fellowships or shoot, you know, um, especially if you're in the U.S., the odds of you having your own uh, laptop or, or something, um, is almost 100% if you're in this field. And so the ability to just uh, uh, pick something and say, hey, I'm, I, I'm, I'm a comic collector. Can I uh, uh, catalog all my comics? Or, you know, and in the end, that software may or may not be something that's useful to anybody or even you, but in the process of building it, you will have learned way more. <laughs> and, and it kind of comes back, now that comes back to your DevOps question, right, which is, um, I have yet to see any educational programs that focus on the on software development as a process and the actual mechanics of like what is it like to really build, debug, and deploy a piece of software, right? Cl classes usually are like, oh, here's some algorithms or here's a web page or, um, but but as a positive example. Um, my, my wife uh, is the executive director for Missing Children Minnesota, which is a nonprofit that, as you might expect, helps find missing kids. And a, uh, one of these uh, boot camp teachers approached her and said, hey, you know, my, my students need a project. Um, can we do something for you? And she said, well, boy, it'd be really great if I had uh, a way to just type in a bunch of this data and get some reports out of it. And a um, you know, very small focused prod problem. And so they did, they, they built a website, they used Angular and, and Node.js on the server. And um, you know, uh, was it fancy? No, did it, did it end up really solving the problem? In the short term, the answer is yes, actually it got used. But in the long run, you know, it's not enterprise software. But my point being, those students that built that software built real software, debugged it, actually had to get a user, get my wife to approve it. Um, it had to be rolled out and running on a real server. I mean, they got the end to end story. And so I gotta believe, and I have no way of knowing, but I gotta believe that every one of those uh, students got snapped up by somebody and who was very happy to hire them. Yeah, it just made me think too, so I, so I was, I started, I got into technical project management and, and, and uh, so I built for a number of years, I built out project management organizations for companies. And so I was always, you know, side by side in those roles with IT, with, with development teams. 
And then I got into and started building out and supporting software configuration management systems and helping build the process side of that. I remember having a conversation around 2000, 2002, somewhere right there where um, I, so my, I had a company, I sold my software company in 2001 and, and uh, went to another startup but was also doing advisory projects for uh, uh, student run uh, startups coming out of UC Berkeley and out of Stanford and, and we had some client projects and things. But I remember talking with an undergrad student at the time, I think at UC Berkeley was just like, well, what are your recommendations? What do you see? Like, where do I have the best chance of making the most money in this role and coming out of it? And I said back then, I said, look, uh, you know, if you go and focus on SCM and focus on this, the operational activities around it, we didn't have, of course, the phrase, the term DevOps back then, but that was all those, those tools. And then if, if you go in this, everybody's going and again, learning the program that they want to go build this other thing. There is a, a bleeding need you know, behind the scenes for all the operational aspects in support of every, like every single company needs to do this, whether you have a dedicated IT team or not, or you provide it as a service to these smaller companies, they need those capabilities. And like, you know, I've not ever seen a program developed specifically looking at those things. I have to believe there's something out there in, in you know, now that's focused on, I've not come across that. I'll, I'll certainly tout it if I if I find a company, you know, an organization, an educational institution that has a DevOps focused program. And as soon as I hit publish on this video, I'm sure people will email me and point out all the ones. I, I have no doubt. I, I mean, <laughs> I, I'm not aware either. I, I do think it's challenging, right? Because um, true DevOps is um, really it encompasses the process of everything to do with development, everything to do with QA, everything to do with security, everything to do with deployment, release management, and operations. Um, and, you know, in, so what we just described is like four different um, careers that people make their entire living in. Right. And um, somebody who's a DevOps expert may not be an expert developer, but they have to understand development. And they may not be an expert ops manager, or, right, or or uh, Linux, uh, you know, system admin, but they have to have a pretty good grasp of how all that stuff works. I mean, it's, you know, it's a tall order. It's a very broad um, skill set that can't be too shallow in any of those areas because they are um, uh, they have to be able to at least interact intelligently with the experts in each one of those spaces, right? Right. So. Um, it, it it makes me a little skeptical to think that DevOps itself is an entry level position. Um, you know, just just because there's, That's there's good, so much there. Yeah, right? you're right. You're you're right. It's it, it is. I mean, look, I, I I and I'm not I'm not trying to like suggest there's a hey, what's the quick fix solution to come in and and take some of these more senior roles? I think I think the ra reality. You're right. It, it's you need to get your hands dirty. You need to have that experience. You need to uh, uh, kind of you know, earn that, you know, that education out in the real world um, for whatever dis discipline that you're coming from. Uh, you need to have that real experience. And uh, I mean, there's, there's a plenty of opportunity. If people, I think it's, it is good to have people to have that focus, to know that there's that need and go in with the intent of learning these different parts and being in that DevOps space, uh, the reality is most people develop into that those roles through uh, those those different disciplines from different areas. I mean, my again, my background I used to work in the the, the, the space was building your know, project portfolio management solutions. That's how I got into information management, and that's how I found SharePoint. Kind of got into the microsystem Microsoft ecosystem that direction. I was a I was a big rational software guy. I, mm -hmm. I wrote a book for IBM, you know, like I was in that world. Um, and it was, uh, you know, SharePoint that kind of sucked me in. Um, and I've stayed. Um, but that, you know, again, it was one of those things where, uh, you know, I started down one path and saw that there was a need. There was a, you know, there was a fundamental misunderstanding of the need of 
the collaboration technology and support of all these things, project portfolio management. Um, I did a deployment of project server back in 2005 and uh, it got introduced to the SharePoint, but kind of all those different pieces. And so, in fact, I started at Microsoft in 2006. So I was an employee for three and a half years. Uh, and uh, like two months after I started, my IBM book was published finally. And they wanted me to promote it. And I'm like, sorry, can't. I'm, I'm no that, longer. That's awkward, this. right? I'm no longer in the SCM world and I work for Microsoft. Right, right. So no, I will not be able to go and do any other things in support of the book that you just published. But thank you for the book. <laughs> I think what you just touched on something though that, that to me has always been a big a big deal and that is um careers are folks get focused on a job um but realistically if you're gonna be in this industry um you're gonna you need a career and a career lasts it transcends jobs and it lasts probably 30 or more years right 40 years whatever and um you can be intentional about that or you can stumble into things and i think most of us do some combination of the two especially early in in like in my career i, I graduated from university in a, in a recession and so i just took the first job i could get I'm like ah you know just just give me, let get me out of the um part-time jobs i was doing to pay the rent and let me have a real job and uh um and my second job was actually kind of accidental, but I got it through a relationship that I had developed in my first job. Um, but from there, my career became a lot more intentional, where by, by that point I was, what, six years, seven years into my career. I kind of had a pretty good idea what I did and didn't enjoy doing. And so as I moved further in my career, and it's not like I didn't go do some things that I found out I very much disliked, but I did it by choice, right? For example, um, I, I took a job managing a group of about 40 consultants at one point, and um, you know, dealing with sales, managing the consultants, all this stuff, I hated that job. And um, what I discovered out of that is I don't, uh, I, I, I do enjoy, um, aspects of sales but i don't particularly enjoy being the manager over a large group of people and you know i don't know if 30 is a large but 30 was large enough that i'm like yeah that's that's not what i want to do well, with you know, the, the magic number for direct reports is it's only five yeah i know it, well and, and i had people it, yeah, it, yeah but in consulting it's uh, yeah at, at least the companies i've worked with usually you have some sort of a manager that manages maybe like 20 people and then they report up into a, a unit manager and so i was at the unit level hmm. so i actually i did have a couple folks that help you know manage this but then the unit level it's like well now i've got a uh, i own the the profit and loss for these people and i have to keep them billable i have to work with you know um and and i know people that thrive on that I work daily now with people that, that do that and, and they thrive on it and enjoy it immensely. Yep. And I don't. And I guess that's my point is that as you get in far enough into your career and it, those first couple, three years, it's difficult to know, I think. But when you get into the five to seven range, you probably start to think, ah, you know, I, I, am I going to be happy writing code for the next 20 years? No, I'm not. Or yes, I am. Right. Um, but that should inform your decision. Um, you know, uh, I mean, I work with people and have over time, you know, um, like a literal rocket scientist who got tired of rocket science-y stuff and wanted to write software. Um, uh, you know, it's like, why would you give up what seems like such a glamorous um, career path? And he's like, eh, it was fun for a while, but I just didn't, you know, it, it turns out that um, what seems romantic to one person, you start doing it on a daily basis and it's like, yeah, this is kind of a grind. You, you know, one of my favorite management books, you just reminded me, what's that guy? He's the, the YouTube star that was a NASA rocket scientist and now he does videos, one of the best ones that he does. Do you know who I'm describing? I'm, I don't know his name, but, uh, but he does these video, YouTube videos where it's all science-based 
he created a uh, a tracking package to solve some of the stealing packages off front porches and it does a glitter bomb and it sprays auto sprays fart spray and yes i did see stuff. that video yeah, yeah. Anyway, that, well. that guy he was a nasa scientist like that yeah that's that's a guy that's just like yeah it was a cool job but that this sounds a lot more fun over here you know there's a one of my favorite leadership development books is by marcus buckingham in fact when I was at Microsoft and I was part of the, uh, you're probably not familiar, uh, but it, it was the management excellence community mech inside of Microsoft for people managers. And I was part of the leadership team for that. And so we got to meet with Marcus uh, a couple of times. He was out there advising Bomber on something and had some extra time. And so like 10 of us got to go meet with him for a couple hours and talk about it. His book, called first break all the rules i don't know if you've ever read that one of my all-time favorites and it's it's my my management style but it kind of speaks to what you described it's the best that most highly functional teams the the highest successful teams are those where the manager is able to um to understand to discover understand the uh the strengths of the individuals in the team and to build teams based on their strengths and, uh, and when you can do that for yourself, like, so I had a, a team where I had uh, an analyst who was just had just a brilliant mind for, uh, for data analysis. I then had a PM who didn't have a technical bone in her body, but was fantastic people person and paired together, they like, they crushed every single project put in front of them. And because you had one that had a deathly fear of presenting, standing up in front of an audience and sharing the results, but then a PM who thrived on that and could make it just look, you know, those people that are good at PowerPoint and it's beautiful and functional and all of that, like that, that's a gift to do that. But when paired together, I mean, it was just, it was fantastic. And, and uh, so I've built a couple teams uh, based on that since reading that book and, and that philosophy and, but when you understand that about yourself, I know what some of my core skills are. I know what my weak skills are or my non-skills. And so I will, I, like I've gone, as you said, I've kind of built my career where I gravitate towards those things where I know those, those are my strengths. And I've been blessed that I've been able to do that. You can't always do that, obviously. You know, we, we all have there's, to. There's a reason they call it work. Right. And, and that's, you know, so... And, and I think in our industry in particular, and, and by, by our industry, I'm including BAs, PMs, developers, designers, right? I mean, that's the, the people, these are the types of roles that I work with on a regular basis. And so I think all of us are so fortunate in that we, there's enough variety in the software development industry that you can almost certainly find something that lights your passion. And that's going to pay well, um, and, and and so we get to you know go to work, and for the most part, we probably get to do something that we actually enjoy and get paid well for. But it's not. I mean, it's it's also the real world. So even if you're in the middle of doing something you truly love, bad things happen, right? I mean, deadlines get cut or or you know missed or or you know you end up with somebody that working with you that you're you just butt heads constantly yeah and, and so that's why it's called work too that's you know but uh i do think though that that and so i think i've, I've been in bad spots a few times where you know working with people i didn't like or whatever it was and sometimes you just kind of push through it or sometimes it's like well you know there's enough opportunity out there that i don't have to uh I'm not trapped, right? Um, uh, and although I get it, everybody's, as soon as I say that, now you're going to get stuff on this video about how well I'm, I'm trapped. You know, and, <laughs> yeah. and I get that. I, I, I understand, right? It, some, you know, there's, everybody's got different life circumstances. But, um, but I do think that we are um, generally very fortunate in our industry to have the just, yeah. Uh, I used to work for a company that um, so many people would would get out of the tech space into management because that was the kind of the, the way up. That was the path, right? Well, that and, was to move up and make more and yeah. do that. But yeah, and uh, um, and 
And that was true, I think, broadly in our industry for a time back, you know, in the 90s and maybe even early 2000s. But, you know, nowadays, um, like developers and designers, a lot of a lot of these roles um, uh, pay so well that that from a money perspective, becoming a manager isn't necessarily an up, it's more of an over. Right. And so I think that's awesome because then you can look at that and say, hey, maybe I'm tired of being a developer or a designer. Uh, maybe I don't want to do this for the, you know, the next decade or more. Um, maybe I want to, and, and the, but this is the mind shift, switch careers and become the best manager, the best leader, the, you know, um, and I think that's the key because um, if you think, oh, I'm a technologist and I'm just going to manage people, um, and you don't, like, to your point, right, you start reading books and you start studying and you really start learning the skills about what it is to be an effective leader. Um, I mean, it's that's a... Different, it's a different skill set. And it's, I, I, think, I, I think because a lot of organizations, and like, the, I mean, this was a problem when I was at, at, at Microsoft, and I know that there's a, they've been doing a lot of work on their culture recognizing this, but the, the creating a path for individual contributors... We're, we're all technologists. I mean, that's part of it. There has to be that path there. Um, and then this idea too that, that uh, you know, just because you're really good at technology does not equate into a good manager. There are horrible managers that have sh never should have been in charge of other human beings. I had a couple, uh, you know, and, and just shouldn't have been in management. We're fantastic at, at, at the technology, at the work itself. Uh, you know, but you, you can't, as, as a business owner, you know, you cannot uh, move people into those management positions because they're good at the technology. Um, so it's, I, I think some, you're right. Some things have changed within, uh, you know, the technology space just because I think companies have started to recognize that and then created those paths where they can continue, uh, uh, you know, keeping holding on to their their uh best tech people by providing that that ic path for them i agree i i think whatever path a person chooses um i don't know i'm pontificating i guess but <laughs> it seems to me that whatever path a person chooses um it's it's important to strive for uh constant improvement and um you know, like I just I was talking to somebody not that long ago um, about uh, public speaking because I, I do a lot of that. I have for you know over twenty years now. I've been out you know and, and speaking and teaching and presenting and and it, and I said something about using a speech coach. Um, and they said, "Well, why would you use a speech coach?" I'm like, "Am am I as good as I could be?" I don't think so. Right? There's um, you know, and, and we all have our little ticks and quirks and patterns that you fall into. And um, sometimes, uh, you know, just sticking on the, the public speaking uh, trend, sometimes you watch yourself in a video and you're like, oh my God, is that what I really, you know, am doing? Or um, sometimes if you have the chance to avail yourself of a, of a coach that can, um, you know, listen and give you uh, directed feedback, that's how you get better. And and I think that's true. That's like code reviews, right? If you're a software developer, exactly. Um, and, and and a lot of times, code reviews are not treated this way, but but they should be treated as a coaching, mentoring, career, skill building. Uh, yeah, we're improving the quality of individual bits of code, but we're also improving my quality and the other people's quality. You know, whoever's reviewing my code. Um, yeah, I, I just. I don't know. I think it behooves all of us to to take advantage of that sort of thing uh, whenever we can. I, I agree. I mean, whether you're writing something, having somebody go in there, like, and you know how this is. It, I can read through something that I've put together, a, a detailed article, a two thousand word paper, and uh, and then somebody else looks at it and points out like a dozen typos, like uh, that <laughs> word doesn't pick up, or it's just odd wording and. And it's all right in your mind. I mean, yeah, yeah, it's, it's in, I was going to advocate for, uh, well, you know, the PowerPoint online has that uh, coaching, uh, that AI based coaching tool. So you can actually go in there, hit the record button. And it will actually track all of the pregnant pauses, the ums and ahs, 
it'll look at, uh, you know, like gender specific language as you're presenting and make recommendations. Um, just a bunch of really cool stuff that's coming from that. There was a, a, a guy that uh, uh, spoke, I'm trying to remember his name, escapes me here, but uh, was, was speaking at a conference that I put together back in like 2002, 2003 in the Bay Area. And he did something which was, I thought, just brilliant. But he, it was a keynote that he had given a couple other times. He had the entire thing down in a binder. So all of his slides, the points he was going to make, the jokes he was going to tell. And what he gave the presentation, there was a guy that he hired sitting in the audience with this binder uh, and was taking notes. And afterwards, like, what, what, you know, what was that all about? He said, yeah, so... So I've gone through it. I've gotten feedback on it. He gives this same speech to large enterprises and audiences like ours that we had about 500 people in the audience. And he says, uh, he's going through, this is a relatively new talk. And so he was writing notes like this joke didn't land. This one was great. This wording, it didn't like when you expected people to be nodding, no one was nodding, you know, just took those kinds of observational notes. I'm like, that's brilliant. I, cause, cause you can get the record, have the recording and watch it. You're going to still attach some of the same biases that you have. You won't hear some of the feedback, but to have somebody go and specifically like this, you know, when you said this, this like people, it resonated, uh, you know, Hey, there could be other opportunities within that. Anyway, that's, Oh, that's phenomenal. I'm fascinated by that kind of stuff. You know, it, it makes me um, think of a book, uh, now I can't think of the name, but uh, Neil Stevenson, uh, he wrote it with somebody else, and it was about the uh, perfect candidate, um, where where uh, they uh, put a chip in this guy's head, and then they were doing real time polling or, or um, had had mood monitoring uh, things in crowds as he was speaking, mm -hmm. and and uh, of course he was undefeatable because in real time he was able to. Uh, it's fiction, right? Yeah. But yeah. Um, yeah, so you say not that not that <laughs> fictional, right? That's when right. you think about the the, the short uh, feedback loops that we have now with media, uh, it's, it's happened to all of the uh, all of the devices that we're wearing. <laughs> it's like you know, I said heart rate went up across two thirds of the crowd. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's it's exactly and and uh, it's just it's, IoT, it's, Rocky. Come on, you know we. Oh yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. There you go. It's it's like the new uh, thing. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I I don't honestly I don't think we're too far from from that world. But well, hey Rocky, really appreciate your time today. Uh, you know, so I like to wrap all these by just asking though people want to find out more about you, get in touch with you, kind of where can they find you through social channels? Where are you active? How can people reach out to you? I tend to be probably most publicly active on Twitter. Um, I also have a presence on LinkedIn. Um, and, uh, those are probably the easiest. You can go to about.me slash Rockford Latka. And, uh, I've got all my contact information and socials are there. So that's, uh, but uh, yeah, and I, I, I tend to be out there a lot. So it's, I'm pretty easy to find. Well, Rocky, I, I, I will, I won't be seeing you in any Microsoft events here for the next, uh, 12 months, but, uh, stay safe, stay healthy. And, Hopefully, we'll see you sooner rather than later at one of these uh, events as things open back up. I look forward to it, Christian. Hey, thank you so much for this. I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot for taking the time, and have a great weekend. Bye-bye.